When Scooby-Doo Where Are You premiered back in 1969, it took the whole world by storm. The show's production company, Hanna-Barbera, was already known for popular cartoons such as The Flintstones, The Jetsons, Yogi Bear, and many more. But when Scooby-Doo premiered, it quickly became their most popular cartoon. It was so popular that Hanna-Barbera took the Scooby-Doo formula and just squeezed every last penny out of it that they could. The formula itself was simple. A handful of teenagers with vastly different personalities solve mysteries. Throw in some zany antics and a random mascot and you've got yourself a hit cartoon. They saw so much success from Scooby-Doo that they decided to replicate that format across many other cartoons to come. Josie and the Pussycats would see a group of teenagers solving mysteries with a cat. Then we got the same exact thing but this time in outer space? The Funky Phantom saw a group of teenagers solving mysteries with a ghost? Huh. Jabberjaw saw a group of teenagers solving mysteries with a shark? Okay, th things are starting to get a little out of hand here. Speed Buggy saw a group of teenagers solving mysteries with their car? Wait, hold on. Their... their car? And Goober and the Ghost Chasers saw a group of teenagers solving mysteries with their dog. Okay, hold on. They didn't even change the formula this time. What the hell? Okay, okay, we've gotten too far off topic and there's too many teenagers and wacky mascots. Who, who are we talking about again? Oh yeah, that's right, Scooby-Doo. Not only did Hanna-Barbera try to replicate the success of Scooby-Doo with multiple other cartoons, they decided to create many different versions of Scooby-Doo that would continue to pop up over the coming decades. We saw the new Scooby-Doo movies, Scooby and Scrappy-Doo, the 13 ghosts of Scooby-Doo, but of all the versions of Scooby-Doo, there is one that would reign supreme. Back in 1984, Muppet Babies premiered to massive success. They took the Muppets everyone knew and loved already and turned them into babies, which spawned an award-winning show that would spark another wave in children's shows to come. In the late 80s and early 90s, we would see many other cartoons incorporate that same exact idea, such as the Flintstones Kids, Tom and Jerry Kids, and Tiny Toon Adventures, which wasn't the same exact Looney Tunes as kids, but close enough. But among this wave of beloved children's characters being time-traveled back into their infancy emerged the greatest form of Scooby-Doo to ever be broadcast on television. A pup named Scooby-Doo premiered in 1988, almost 20 years after the original Scooby-Doo Where Are You? And absolutely no opinions are expressed here, only straight up facts. This is the best version of Scooby-Doo that you will ever watch, period. It had the same exact Scooby-Doo formula with the same exact characters, but this time they were all kids. I can't quite put my finger on it, but there's just something so charming about this show. The real monster is Red Herring! Hey, what are you doing in my house? Get that camera out of my face, you weenie! This show took all of the greatest aspects of Scooby-Doo and put a whimsical and even more childlike spin on it that was just so captivating. Even to this day, when I put this show on, it immediately keeps my attention. It's a show that even 33 years later still holds up great in my opinion. So that's why today we are going to look at my top 5 most iconic episodes of A Pup Named Scooby-Doo. And heads up, if I miss your favorite episode, let me know in the comments down below. I always take note of the comments pointing out which episodes that you, the viewers, thought should have been included, so that I make sure that someday, when I make part two of this video, that I include your favorite episodes, because you guys always point out the absolute bangers that I forgot to put on my list. If you enjoy this video, make sure you click that like button. If you're already subscribed, then thank you so much. Words can't describe how much I appreciate you subscribing and watching my videos. I recently hit 160 subscribers, which is an absolute mind blower for me. If you're new here, then do me a solid and watch this video all the way through. If you enjoy it, then click that subscribe button if you want more content similar to this video. It helps me a ton, and it's cool that you get to be a part of my YouTube journey. Now let's all put on our mystery solving hats, and let's take a nostalgic walk down memory lane together. Number 5. A Bicycle Built for Boo 
This is the first ever episode of A Pup Named Scooby-Doo, and it introduced us to Coolsville, USA and the Young Scooby-Doo Detective Agency for the first time. It begins with Shaggy oversleeping for his job delivering newspapers, so Scooby jumps in like a bull in a china shop and wakes him up with a good old Eddie Guerrero fashioned five star frog splash. Shaggy sends Scoob out to load the newspapers onto his bike, and for the first time, we're introduced to one of my favorite things about this show the music. Just listen to this for a second and tell me it doesn't slap harder than Vasily Kamatsky, the slap fighting champion. While Scoob is loading up the newspapers, we are introduced to the villain of this cartoon, a big old green gooey monster. The monster straight up steals Shaggy's bike while Scooby runs for his life. Zoinks! Like what's wrong, Scoob? You look like you've seen a ghost! Well, exactly! We then cut to the treehouse headquarters of the Scooby-Doo Detective Agency, where Shaggy is crying his eyes out over his stolen bike. Meanwhile, everyone is confused as to why a ghost would want Shaggy's nearly 30-year-old bike. Naturally, Freddy immediately points the blame to Red Herring, the neighborhood bully, and they follow Red into his hideout, which of course is in Weirdo Woods of all places. While wandering the woods, Red dresses up as a swamp monster and scares the hell out of them. Velma finds Red's bike, which leads to Freddy immediately accusing him of stealing it from Shaggy and painting it blue. And to prove it, Freddy takes an electric sander to Red's bike, which really just pisses him off. In retaliation, Red straight up runs over Freddy with his bike. After looking at the tire tracks on Freddy's face, Velma gets the idea to look for tire tracks left by the stolen bike. Scooby takes them on a wild goose chase following the tracks, and we're again treated to an absolute banger. Scooby leads the gang to the Daily Blabber News Building, where they all meet Shaggy's boss, Mr. Conrad. While they're there, Scooby stumbles upon some green-colored dry printing ink that sends him into a sneezing fit. Now, let's not forget that part, because it's an important key to solving this mystery. Well, Scoob, I guess you made front page news! <laughs> <laughs> I don't get it! They leave the Daily Blabber, and the wild goose chase continues, this time leading to a spooky house known as the Ferguson Estate. Scooby is sure that Shaggy's bike is here, but being absolutely terrified, he refuses to go in. While searching the grounds of the estate, Scooby stumbles upon the green ghoul again, who tells them to get out and then runs away. The group then stumbles upon Shirley McLoon, the world famous psychic medium, on the grounds of the estate. She says that her psychic powers led her there, and she gives them a message from the great beyond. Wait! I'm receiving a message from the beyond! I am Rasma of the Netherworld. She then tells them to have a nice day and leaves, almost as if nothing just happened. As she walks away, she drops a camera, which causes Freddy to hypothesize that she's an alien agent from Mars that's come to steal bikes in order to take over the world. While Freddy is off in his own head, Scooby finds Shaggy's bike fender and nearby footsteps which lead them into the Ferguson estate. Once inside, they fall through a hole in the ground and find the basement, which is just stuffed full of money. Hey, now I can buy myself a new bike, Scoob! What am I yakking? I can buy like a million! New bikes. Velma does a little research on the bills and finds out that every single bill has the same exact serial number on it. They also end up going a little further and they find a printing press deeper in the basement of the estate that looks suspiciously like the same printing press at the Daily Blabber. They also find Shaggy's bike down there, but the chain is missing from his bike and instead it's being used as a part on the printing press. Then the monster busts in and the gang splits up. In possibly every single episode of this show, we are treated to a chase scene complete with the most fire music possible. Seriously, check this shit out. Here comes the gloppy green ghost. The ghost that we all hate the most. After the chase, Scooby and Velma stumble upon more dry ink, which causes Scooby to have a perfectly timed sneezing fit that propels him towards the monster and ends up launching the monster into the printing press. Velma pulls the lever for the press, which then turns it on and traps the monster inside. Now it's time to put on your thinking cap as we are called out in a direct fourth wall break. Do you know who it is? Ooh, 
Well then, let's review the facts. Fred tries to blame it all on Shirley, but turns out that the girls already found Shirley who is locked up by the monster. She reveals that she isn't actually a medium, but is actually an undercover agent looking into the counterfeit money. After connecting all the dots, Velma finally reveals that the green ghoul is none other than Shaggy's boss, Mr. Conrad. I'd still be in business if it hadn't been for you pesky kids and that dog. Tell it to the judge. As Mr. Conrad is getting arrested, Shaggy quits his job. With the mystery solved and Shaggy having gotten his bike back, the the episode ends with the crew in an ice cream parlor, enjoying themselves at Shaggy's expense. 25 bucks, but all right, who's been picking out? <laughs> Scooby Dooby Doo! <laughs> Number 4 Lights, Camera, Monster. The beginning of this episode focuses on Freddy, who just got a camera for his birthday, pursuing his career as a director. According to the local tabloid, The National Exaggerator, mall monsters are becoming a huge problem. So Freddy is making a movie called I Was a Teenage Mall Monster to capitalize on this completely not made up epidemic. Scooby was cast as the monster in this film, but when Fred calls him into the set, the pointy green monster Stinkweed shows up instead, terrifying the group of kids. Stinkweed then proceeds to go on a robbing spree in the mall, robbing a jewelry store and a pet store before retreating and disappearing into a plant store. Right after the gang leaves, we see a woman appear right behind the counter mysteriously. Freddy, who is bummed to have to solve a mystery instead of working on his movie, gets an idea. Say, I know! We could make a video movie about how we solve cases! Good, Good idea. idea! We interrupt a pup named Scooby-Doo for the special announcement. Freddy had a good idea! It's a miracle! Thank you. The crew sees a poster in the mall for the premiere of the new movie Stinkweed 10, complete with an appearance by Vincent Thorne, the actor who plays Stinkweed in the movie. The next day, they go to the premiere and Daphne immediately gets in Vincent's face, accusing him of robbing the stores. Meanwhile, I'm just dumbfounded that this huge dude can somehow fit in that little gangly Stinkweed costume. After some questions, Vincent offers to hire the gang to solve the mystery and clear his name since everyone is accusing him of being the robber. After the first showing of Stinkweed, we 10 lets out, that same woman comes out of the theater. Scat puppy. Then out comes Grady Lawrence, a fellow actor who's been following Vincent, trying to make him look bad so he can take Vincent's role in the film. He is particularly stoked that Vincent is being framed for the robberies in hopes that he'll get to play Stinkweed when Vincent's gone. They follow Grady to a set of a commercial that he's acting in, and they search his dressing room. While in there, they end up finding the cash register from the pet store under his bed. They also see that same lady from the plant store and the movie theater sneaking around the commercial set as well, disguised as a buck of chicken. Then, Vincent calls and tells them that he found a clue in the mall. The gang comes quickly to find Vincent being attacked by the imposter Stinkweed. They get chased by Stinkweed into a shoe store where they trick him. Like it's about time you showed up. Do these come in purple? And I need a pair of red go-go boots, size 4 AAA. Of course. Sorry. How are these, miss? Oh, here's your purple, sir. Uh, try this one. Stinkweed ends up getting launched out of the store and into a bush by a balloon that Shaggy requested him to blow up, and the group follows in hot pursuit. Right when the gang shows up, that mysterious lady from before shows up, and Freddy accuses her of being the monster, but she reveals that she's actually with the FBI, and that she has almost enough clues to prove that Vincent committed the crimes he's been accused of. They tell her about all the clues they have against Grady, and she runs off saying she needs to alert her supervisors at the FBI. Next, the gang spies Stinkweed around the corner, using Grady's shoes to make footprints in some bushes nearby. Then we get to my favorite part, the chase montage to some sick-ass 80s tunes. Stinkweed, oh Stinkweed, where'd you get that gnarly smell? You're a bad seed, we can tell. Hey, Stinkweed! After the chase, Velma has seen all she needs in order to solve the mystery. The gang concocts a harebrained scheme to trap Stinkweed. They make a fake movie set and act like they're filming the next Stinkweed movie, and when the Stinkweed imposter shows up, he plays along and acts in the film. But of course, with Freddy directing, things don't go according to plan, and the initial trap they set fails to catch the imposter Stinkweed. Thankfully, Tarzan Scooby swings in on a vine and kicks Stinkweed into some quicksand that traps him. Then, we put on our mystery-solving spectacles as we get yet another fourth wall break. 
Well, we finally caught Stinkweed. But do you know who he is? After reviewing the evidence, it's finally revealed that the imposter Stinkweed is actually Vincent Thorne himself. Yeah, and I would have gotten away with it too if it wasn't for you pesky kids. <laughs> and that pup, Scooby of the Jungle. We find out that he couldn't stand making another Stinkweed movie, so he was trying to make Stinkweed look bad so the studio wouldn't make any more films starring him. You know, I'd think that it'd be easier to just resign because the studio could easily find a replacement, but nah, I guess a robbery and a mystery makes for better TV. The episode ends with Grady telling the kids that he's auditioning for a new commercial for O'Greasy's Bucket O' Scooby Snacks. Bucket of Scooby Snacks? Oh boy! <laughs> Looks like this commercial will be a big hit with a pup named Scooby Dooby Doo! <laughs> Number 3, Scooby Dude. This episode begins with a very simple premise. Velma got a call this morning and now the gang is headed to the beach. Velma's aunt, Thelma, is the head of the Marine Institute and it seems that their dolphins are disappearing. They meet up with Velma's aunt who speaks in just the most scientifically condescending way. Greetings, relation. I am gratified to have you at my place of vocation. I am pleased to extend hospitality to the cohorts of my relation. Aunt Thelma shows them to the dolphin enclosure, where they used to have 12 dolphins, but now only one is left. While they're meeting Skipper, the last dolphin, they are confronted by the headless skateboarder. I gotta say, I hate how much they beat the word dude like it was a dead horse. This guy says dude at least one time per sentence and it drives me nuts. While the group is hiding from the headless skater, they hear Skipper chirping for help, but when they go to the dolphin enclosure, Skipper is gone. Scooby sniffs around and picks up a scent to follow. They end up following a trail of food that leads them to the bathrooms where the headless skater is there waiting for them. They run away and hide in a trash can, but it turns out that was just Red Herring messing with them again. Red gets confronted by Sandy Sneakers of the Beach Patrol, who drives off after failing to catch him. The gang takes notice to her scuba gear that she has in the back of her Jeep. Next, they meet Gnarly Charlie, a surfer who's totally stoked that the monster showed up because now people are staying away from the beach that is usually crowded with tourists visiting the Marine Institute. Next, the gang heads out to Al's skate o -rama, a skate park with absolutely no one there because the monster scared everyone off. Al, the owner of the park, who sounds suspiciously like the monster, gives them permission to look around for more clues, but as soon as they start looking towards a shed on the property, the monster shows up again. <laughs> The monster scares them off, and they deduce that the monster clearly doesn't want them to see whatever Al has hidden in that shed. The gang decides to go back at nighttime and search the shed, where they find a bunch of skateboarding trophies all awarded to Fast Track Al, which is really suspicious considering Al told them he doesn't ride skateboards. Velma does the 1980s equivalent of Google searching to find out that Al used to be an award-winning skater. It says here that Al used to be an international skateboard champ. Like, yeah, but then he got involved with <gasps> drugs. Drugs? Yep. As a kid, this part made me never want to do drugs, because drugs are bad, of course. But as an adult, it just makes me chuckle a little bit knowing that this episode aired in the 80s when Ronald Reagan was president and the war on drugs had recently started. The kids decide it's a good idea to go bang on Al's door in the middle of the night to question him about what they just found out. They end up making Al cry, and then they tell him to go back to bed. After that, Red Herring finds the gang and asks them for help clearing his name because Sandy Sneakers has been trying to frame 
frame him for being the headless skater. They agree to help him. Next, the gang then throws on their scuba gear as they go to look for clues underwater. They stumble upon a mysterious cave underwater, but then they're met by the headless skater who follows them on an underwater chase that, at first, made me question everything I thought I knew about physics, but the chase music was way too catchy for me to get caught up on that. They lose the monster and make their way to that underwater cave where they find some crazy things. They find the missing dolphins, a bunch of electronics that are used to control the dolphins, and a bunch of drugs. These pouches must be used to carry something. Jinkies! It's drugs! Huh, so that's what drugs look like. I've never seen drugs before, so that's a first for me. The gang goes back to Al's skatorama to find Al and Gnarly Charlie talking. They ask to go look for clues, which Al agrees to, but they're quickly interrupted by the headless skater. A harebrained scheme gone wrong leads to the monster getting caught in a net, and as you've probably guessed by now, it's time to sit down in your thinking chair and think, as we're called to solve the mystery via another fourth wall break. Well, we've caught the monster, but do you know who it is? Turns out that this whole time, and this is a shocker, you're, you're not going to believe this, it was Al who was behind the headless skater all along. He was stealing the dolphins to smuggle drugs. Drugs? Yuck! And massive plot twist, Sandy Sneakers was in on it the whole time, which is why she was trying to frame Red Herring all along. And extra plot twist, turns out Gnarly Charlie is actually an undercover FBI agent who arrests both of them. Yeah, and we would have gotten away with it if it weren't for those pesky kids. And don't forget their awesome pup, Scooby Doo. At the end, Red refuses to pay for them helping him, even though he already agreed to. So Scooby knocks him into the dolphin enclosure. Okay, I'll pay, I'll pay. Like collecting bills is easy for Skipper and a pup named Scooby Dooby Doo. <laughs> Number 2. Wanted Cheddar Alive This episode begins at the Scooby Snack Factory. We see a few employees inspecting the chocolate, which is concerning as all hell considering that they're a factory producing dog treats and dogs can't eat chocolate, but I digress. Across the factory in the cheese lab, something evil is cooking. Did you hear something? No, do you? Huh. He's Nacho Average Munster, and of course he's up to no Gouda. And if you think that's the last cheese pun I'm gonna throw in, you Gouda another thing coming. I promise they only get feta from here. No more Scooby Snacks. <laughs> Meanwhile, Shaggy is making some breakfast. Naturally, he's making a gigantic pancake, which he, of course, tops with a literal oil drum of syrup. Scooby, on the other hand, is preparing to have a Scooby snack for breakfast. Shaggy's massive pantry filled with boxes of Scooby snacks are all empty. I don't know what I'm more surprised by. The fact that Shaggy has a hundred empty boxes of Scooby snacks that he didn't throw away when he grabbed the last one from them, or the fact that he doesn't have one box stashed away in queso emergency. <laughs> Scooby immediately sprints to the grocery store, dragging Shaggy with him. The grocery store is completely sold out of Scooby snacks, much to his dismay. Scooby and Shaggy go home where Velma is giving Scooby a checkup because apparently he's going through Scooby snack withdrawal, when suddenly the president of the Scooby snack factory, Constance McSnack, appears on a TV news broadcast saying that a cheesy monster scared away all of her workers and there will be no more Scooby snacks. The president of the Acme Dog Biscuits factory then comes on air to say that their biscuits will be on the shelves, but when Shaggy offers to buy them, Scooby shows his distaste for the Acme brand. Let me look. Yeah. Back at the Scooby Snack factory, Mrs. McSnack is talking to the police who can't find any trace of the monster and the guy from Acme is there to offer her a job, making it clear that he's after her recipes for Scooby Snacks, but she says they're all locked up in the factory that's closed down. 
The gang shows up to let Mrs. McSnack know that they're on the case. There's only one person she can think of that may have done this, and that's her old employee, Boris Roquefort. Which, in case you didn't know, Roquefort is a type of blue cheese that's made with the milk of a sheep. The gang goes into the factory in search of clues, where they make their way into the cheese lab. In the giant mess of a room, they stumble upon the Scooby Snack Top Secret Formula. We interrupt a pup named Scooby-Doo for this special announcement. You've just seen an important clue. Thank you. Then the cheese monster appears and chases them out of the room. They make a getaway and continue their search. They stumble upon a brand new suit covered in cheese and thrown in a garbage can. Later on, the gang finds themselves in a chemistry lab where they hear a noise out in the hall. They go outside and for a split second, you can see the guy from the Acme Dog Miscuits building running away. Shaggy and Scooby end up on the chase riding an office chair and they end up finding Boris Roquefort roaming the factory. They question Boris and he explains that he's working on a secret new flavor of Scooby Snack, presumably to get his old job back. Boris runs off when Freddy accuses him of being the cheese monster, and right when he runs away, the cheese monster shows up, and like clockwork, a chase ensues to some ridiculously catchy music. Usually the chase sequence results in the gang throwing the monster off of their tail, but this time they get caught by the cheese monster while Scooby escapes. Scooby comes back to save the day, and right when he gets cornered, Scooby decides to beat the cheese monster the best way that he knows how, by eating him. With all the cheese gone from him, the monster runs away, but Velma stops him by using her yo-yo to tie up his feet. Like maybe we should call the police and let them grill this cheese monster. Get it? <laughs> grill cheese? Grilled cheese? <laughs> <laughs> I don't get it. As you've probably guessed, it's time to strap on your big boy mystery solving trousers as we get our routine fourth wall break. But we still don't know who the monster is. Do you know who it is? Let's review. After reviewing all the clues, we find out that the cheese monster was obviously the Acme Dog Biscuits guy. If you didn't see that coming from a mile away, you must be blind. Or maybe me when I was five. Bah, and I would have done it too if it hadn't been for you pesky kids and that puppy. He ate my costume! <laughs> Mrs. McSnacks explains that she hired Mr. Roquefort back, and he's working on a special reward for Scooby. Scooby ends up being gifted a lifetime supply of Boris's brand new flavor, bubblegum Scooby Snack. This is just enough to last a whole day for a pup named... Scooby Dooby Doo! <laughs> Number 1. The Schnook Who Took My Comic Book It might be because I'm a giant nerd who loves comic books, but this episode is by far my absolute favorite, and it was my favorite long before I even started reading comic books too. This was also the first episode to feature Shaggy and Scooby as Commander Cool and Mellow Mutt. The episode begins at the first annual Coolsville Comic Con. Shaggy saved up all of his money to buy a Commander Cool number one comic book, Commander Cool and Mellow Mutt versus Dr. Croker. Just when Shaggy's talking about how hyped he is for a weekend of nothing but comics and no spooky mystery solving, Dr. Croker himself appears to steal Shaggy's comic book. They run off and meet up with the rest of the gang. Later on, Shaggy and Scooby go back to the booth where they bought the comic book from to see if Selma, the person that owns the booth, saw the monster. As they walk up, they notice Mr. Cashmore, the guy running the booth next door. He's a huge asshole who doesn't even like comic books and is just there to rip people off. After Mr. Cashmore leaves, Dr. Croker shows up again to terrorize Shaggy. Dr. Croker comes up and eats Selma's very last Commander Cool number one comic, then turns his sights to Shaggy in an attempt to devour his comic next. Shaggy and Scooby escape Dr. Croker, and later they end up getting in line to have Wendell McWendell, the creator of Commander Cool, sign his comic book. There were only three copies left of that exact comic book, but with Selma's having been eaten, there are only two left now. One owned by Shaggy, and one owned by Wendell McWendell himself. After getting his comic signed, Shaggy and Scooby make like a couple of trees and leave, but as they're leaving, Dr. Croker shows up and eats Shaggy's comic, which absolutely crossed the line. I like that does it, Dr. Croker! This time you've gone too far! There's only one way to deal with his kind, right, Scoob? Ta da! Commander Cool! Uh, no. To the rescue! 
Shaggy, or as I'll be calling him from now on, Commander Cool, pulls out a feather and tickles Dr. Croker, which makes him spit the comic out. Commander Cool and Mellow Mutt then run away with Dr. Croker in hot pursuit. Then, Commander Cool says what I am sure we've all been thinking. Hey, wait a minute! What's a chase without some chase music? <laughs> Random trivia fact for you: this was the first episode of this show to feature the monster dancing with the gang during the chase sequence. Just when they thought that they lost Dr. Croker, he appears in a dumpster and eats the comic book and runs off behind a locked door so the gang can't catch him. Commander Cool ends up questioning basically everyone at Comic Con, and the number one suspect ends up being Mr. Cashmore. They tail him into the parking garage where we see him mysteriously hide a comic book in his car, among a stack of other comics in there. Next, we see Wendell McWendell facing a horde of people trying to buy his Commander Cool number one, which he doesn't want to sell, but the group ends up offering him more than he can refuse. He asks the gang to watch his comic for him while he goes to his hotel room to get the key for the lockbox he keeps the comic in. Naturally, Dr. Croker shows up to steal the comic book, which he fails at, and Velma comes up with a plan to take down Dr. Croker that involves making a fake Commander Cool number one comic book for Shaggy to sell that is actually armed with a bubblegum bomb. When Dr. Croker shows up to steal it, they detonate the bomb, trapping him in the gum, and for one last time, let's strap on our mystery solving Yeezys and break that fourth wall. But who is he? Before Dr. Croker is unmasked, who do you think he really is? Let's review the clues. After reviewing the clues, it's revealed that Dr. Croker is none other than Wendell McWendell himself. He wanted to get rid of all the copies of Commander Cool number one so that his would be the only copy in existence and he could make a fortune selling it. And I'd have gotten away with it too if it hadn't been for you pesky kids and that puppy. <laughs> We finally get the answer to another mystery as well. You may have been wondering why Mr. Cashmore was sneaking around and hiding comics in his car, right? Okay, okay, I admit it. I love comics. I can't live without them, but don't tell anyone, please. I'm 55 years old. I'm ashamed to admit it. And with that being said, the episode ends on a positive note with all the comics being returned to their rightful owners. Troublemakers don't stand a chance with a pup named... scooby dooby doo <laughs> If you made it all the way through this video, thank you so much for watching. I appreciate your support more than words could ever say. If you aren't already, now is the perfect time to subscribe to my channel so you don't miss out on more videos just like this one. Make sure you click that like button if you enjoyed this video, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace!